I'm Dr. Mark Attala, and I want to welcome you to the seventh chapter of Bradbury and Carney's Intimate Relationships book. So today we'll be discussing romantic attraction, which I think could better be described as initial romantic attraction. Well, but we'll be discussing that as well as physical appearance and unrequited love and things along those lines. But let's get started by talking about how for most of history, people employed professional matchmakers. And if you've ever seen Fiddler on the Roof, which is outstanding, um, they have matchmakers even at the turn of the 20th century. Now, people fall in love every day, but the factors that turn love into a lasting commitment remain a mystery. So we're going to define romantic attraction as the experience of finding someone desirable as a potential intimate partner with or without a sexual element. So let's get started with physical appearance then too. Now college students rate physical appearance at the top of the list for romantic appeal. That's why I said we'll, we'll discuss it first because it's, it's overarchingly important. Freshmen in a study were more likely to want to ask better looking uh, dates out again. They were matched up. And no other factors influenced this decision for both men and women. Physical appearance studies typically were done on men because it was thought that men value physical appearance more than women. But the best predictor of attraction in men and women is good looks. Okay, Cupid. Now this this is where we're 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 getting deep into the weeds when we're looking at um, online dating sites. They report that the best looking people get more attention, which is really no surprise. Men are more likely to send messages to attractive women, another surprise, but women are more open to sending messages to men that they don't find as attractive. But uh, men were 25 times more likely um, and women were 11 times more likely. So it's not like um, women are sending messages to unattractive men. There's something called the matching phenomena though. And this is where people who are dating or about to get married are rated similar to each other in terms of physical appearance. And you, you can see that, that couple in the, in, to the right. Um, and this is because competition is intense for the most attractive people. And so therefore, it's easier just to be with someone who's about as attractive as you are. Now, good looking people are used to being admired, which I'm sure has been the experience of everyone who's listening to this. Uh, they're more comfortable approaching other people who are good looking also. Does one's appearance influence the kind of people that one is willing to pursue? Well, based on 2 million dating decisions studied, the answer is yes. Back to hot or not. The best looking people got more attention from everyone, but the appearance of the message sender didn't matter. People uh, are less likely to send messages to people um, more attractive to them because they think they're out of their league and they don't want to be rejected. So if less attractive people are less selective, are they less aware of physical appeal? No, of course not. Back to hot or not again. Less attractive individuals had no illusions about attractiveness of the people that they asked out. So physical attraction's strong, but so is the desire to avoid rejection and to make a connection. You're on a dating site to meet somebody. Um, and that supports the matching phenomenon. We assume people who are appealing, um, who are physically attractive, have other positive qualities as well. So when looking at photos, more attractive faces were rated as more interesting, kind, sensitive, and more likely to be successful. People with good looks also have concrete advantages. Again, which probably most of you, or all of you who are listening have experienced. People smile more when talking to attractive people. Handsome men have more conversations with women and good looking women have more dates and sex. Men are more animated and friendly when they believe they're talking to a pretty woman. This was a study that was done where they were showing a picture of the person they thought they were talking to. And women who were believed to be attractive were also more friendly. They, you know, everyone wants to have people who find them attractive. Physical appearance has a strong social impact. Good looking people are more likely to be hired after job interviews and they also tend to have a higher salary. This always reminds me, there's a, um, William James was an early psychologist. He once said that psychology is, um, it's basically a study of the obvious. He said it's an elaboration of the obvious, but. 
So what are the negative consequences of being attractive? Are there any? Well, good looks are associated with vanity and promiscuity. And people are more likely to lie about themselves when they're talking to better looking people because they want to try to impress them. People with naturally good looks, though, are slightly but significantly happier than less attractive people. And evolutionary psychologists suggest that the things we find attractive are markers of good health and a mate. And so they put it in terms of things like um, disease resistance and a lack of parasitic infection, which people don't usually verbalize. So what are some of the features of appealing faces? Well, women with large eyes, a small nose, and high cheekbones are especially attractive. And for men, a wide smile and a broad jaw is seen as attractive. Now, we say that beauty's in the eye of the beholder, and yet we can all agree on what's attractive. And these also seem to be universal in terms of that they're cross-cultural. People can pick out attractive people. Um, yeah. People find average faces to be attractive too. And so they make composite faces that are a blend of features of many people. And they're seen as more attractive than an average person. But that's not true for things like um, people who are, who are very attractive. Um, uh, Etkoff, um, she wrote a book called Survival of the Prettiest and um, goes into this research uh, much more extensively. People find symmetry attractive, again, because asymmetries are usually caused by disease in childhood or parasitic infections. In a short-term fling, physical attractiveness is very important. However, personal characteristics are very important in long-term relationships. And we can talk about this in terms of vertical and horizontal attributes. A vertical attributes, a quality on which people can be ranked hierarchically. So things like attractiveness, health, uh, wealth, those types of things. A horizontal attribute is a quality on which people can differ without being judged as being better or worse. So food preferences, um, although this can be an issue because if somebody's a vegetarian or vegan, um, yeah, that can be a, um, an issue. Uh, what their hobbies are, what their political beliefs are, um, although again, that seems like that could be a vertical attribute too. Personality, though, is a vertical attribute. Everyone wants someone who is agreeable, who gets along with them. Honesty is also important, and we're more attracted to people uh, who are good than people who are fun. Similarity between partners' personalities accounts for only a tiny amount of variation in satisfaction levels. Um, some traits are inherently unattractive, though. So being a disagreeable person, being depressed, or being neurotic is always unattractive. What about complementarity? This is when we're attracted to people who have complementary qualities rather than similar ones. Um, attempts to validate this idea have failed. We tend to want similarity in horizontal attributes, such as the values that people have, their background and their interests. Um, and similar people are validating uh, and they're easy to get along with because you already have a lot in common. And so they validate the beliefs that you already have. Similarity in backgrounds also associated with lower divorce rates, but it doesn't predict satisfaction. If we like someone, we can always find things that we have in common. So I'll, I'll give a personal example. I once dated this woman and we were both really interested in opera and polar exploration. I mean, those are two pretty, pretty narrow things to be interested in. So our first, wait, our first date was at, um, we went to go see an opera. And we had a great time, and it, was, it, it didn't end well. Um, the the long-term relationship wasn't good. People who are attracted to each other perceive a lot of similarities. And this is, seems to be a result of feeling good about the relationship rather than the cause of the relationship. So this was a study that was done where people talked, and then they could overhear the feedback that the person that they talked to gave to the researcher. And surprise, surprise, participants reported that they like their partner more when they know their partner likes them and they don't like them when they're critical. But uh, Aronson and Linder go one step further. They have four groups. Uh, in one case, they only hear positive feedback. In the other case, they only hear negative feedback. They overhear this. You know, they're not supposed to be hearing this. In the third condition, the person starts out with positive feedback and then goes to negative and then 
and the last condition, they start out with negative feedback and then they become more and more positive. And that's the group that's most liked. So we like people who are choosy, um, especially if they choose us. But generally, we like people who grow to like us. Let's talk about unrequited love. And so this is love that's not returned. Uh, some people are, are drawn, sometimes people are drawn to people who reject or ignore them. And more than 80% of college students have said that they've experienced unrequited love. Is it rewarding? Yes, supposedly in three areas. Would-be lovers, the people that they fall in love with that don't love them are desirable, and they perceive that person to bestow uh, very important rewards. They thought that their feelings would be reciprocated one day, they just have to win that person over. And they thought that simply being in love was rewarding enough, it's its own reward. This is the idea, if people work hard enough, then maybe they can win over the object of their affection. And then that's an, uh, a disquieting picture to the right there, which is stalking. This is unwanted or disturbing attention from someone who's wanting to start or continue a romantic relationship. And 15% of women and about 6% of men have said that they've been victims of stalkers. Now, being pursued is not flattering because it's outweighed by the cost of having to reject someone, especially if that someone doesn't want to be rejected. What about people who send mixed messages? Well, playing hard to get is only attractive when it's combined with the message that the game could be won, meaning that a relationship could come out of it. Here's a speed dating study. And so this is over the course of an evening, participants talk one-on-one -on -one with a number of potential partners. I've heard this called eight minute dating before, uh, where you spend eight minutes with each person, they ring a bell, and then you go on to the next one. Men rated physical appearance as more important and women rated earning potential as more important. But there was no correlation between what people said they thought was important and what they wanted after the speed dating was over. So the researchers did another study and they found that they, that they could not predict whether two people would end up liking each other. And they, this is because selecting a mate is not like choosing clothes because the clothes don't have to choose you back. I love that expression. It's a great analogy or simile because I don't know the difference between those. Preferences are also uh, based on context to some extent. So this is a study at the Capilano Suspension Bridge from 1974. Men were stopped by an attractive woman. Uh, so this is a heteronormative study. They're assuming that the men um, find this woman attractive. And they're shown a picture and they have to make up a story about um, what's happening. And they found that men who were um, presented with this scenario above the river told stories with more sexual themes. Uh, and they were more likely to call the woman later too, because she said, if you have any questions, here's my number. They ran the same study on a, a, a much smaller bridge that was nearby, and um, they didn't find that. It's because there's a mis mis misattribution of arousal. We're poor at recognizing sources of our own arousal. And so this is one of the reasons why amusement parks and horror movies are great dates. Um, Ovid, who was an ancient Roman writer, he wrote a book about like about love, and, and that was that was one of his recommendations. He said, if you really like somebody, he didn't put it in terms of misattribution of arousal, but he said, if you really like somebody, then take him to a gladiator fight because all the blood and gore, they're going to feel all excited and and they're going to misattribute the arousal that they feel to being with you rather than watching somebody killed in front of them, apparently. Um, but amusement parks, things like roller coasters, you're all excited and, um, and you misattribute that feeling to the person you're with. They've done studies at bars and the men's ratings of women's appearance went up as they got more drunk and they found the same pattern was true for women too, but only half as much. Uh, there's another study that they didn't go into uh, it's, it's called um, uh, Don't the Girls Get Prettier When It Gets Close to Closing Time, which is part of the, the Country Western School of Romantic um, Attraction Research. But what they found was as it got later in the evening, men found women more attractive, regardless of how much they'd had to drink. And it was because your options were seen, the men's options were seen as limited and closing because the bar was eventually going to close 
And um, yeah, it depended because, you know, were they going to meet somebody? So does where you meet someone make a difference? Uh, a bar or a loud party was thought to promote brief sexual encounters among people they talked to. Montoya did a study where he had men and women imagine themselves in different places and describe their standards for a one night stand. Men had lower standards for bars and parties and higher standards for libraries and churches and women reported the opposite. There are times when the objects of a romantic attraction are really different depending on what the situation is. Let's talk about first moves and mate selection, which is the process through which a committed relationship is formed. First, people notice desirable qualities in the other person. Then they wait to see if the attraction's mutual. Now, all primates do three things. They alert potential mates to their presence, they establish their gender, and they express their availability. And this behavior can be observed also in bars among humans. So they did a study with straight women and men in bars. Uh, what they found was that women gave nonverbal indications of their receptivity, and that made the men come over and initiate a conversation. And so this is called proceptivity. These are anticipatory behaviors that people engage in. Eye contact is a big one. When you lock eyes with somebody across the room and then they walk across the room to meet you, that's a big deal. Behaviors that were interpreted as especially strong signs of interest were things like standing less than 18 inches away, touching the other person while laughing, and touching while they weren't laughing. Um, I'm assuming the conversation was going on and they weren't just silent touching each other. There's something also called behavioral synchron, I'm gonna say synchronicity because I, I don't, can't say the other word. And this is that people unconsciously mimic each other's movements. So they both lean forward, they stretch, uh, they have eye contact. Eye contact is always a big deal. And when people don't find each other attractive, they do the opposite. So they back away um, and they cross their arms and they avoid making eye contact. Well, so there we go. Um, I spilled my water. That's okay. <laughs> Verbal, uh, nonverbal behaviors give people a chance to express their interests subtly. So this is a study by Bernstein in 1983 where people were given an opportunity to, this is again, men, um, it's, it's a heteronormative study because they're assuming they want to sit next to an attractive woman. So they're gonna be seen, see a movie and they could sit in a booth by themselves or with this attractive woman. If the movies were different, the men would squeeze in next, to sit next to the attractive woman. Uh, when they had a non-romantic reason for starting an interaction, um, men were three times more willing to do so. So 75% um, of the men were, wanted to sit next to the attractive woman if it was, if it was a, uh, two different movies, whereas only 25% if it was the same movie. So men are also more likely to interpret uh, women's behaviors uh, and men's behaviors as expressions of attraction. Let's take a minute to talk about hooking up. And this is when two people are having a physical encounter with no expectation of anything more. So they, these uh, interactions tend to be physical and impulsive where people are connecting sexually without emotional involvement. And 75% of graduating seniors in college had said they'd experienced a hookup during their college time. 40% of the times the hookups uh, involved intercourse and 65% of those hookups were preceded by drug or alcohol use. Your book says that today's students go on group dates or they go on dates after a relationship is established. Uh, your relationships may vary. In general, men are happier than women about their own hookups. Let's talk about self-disclosure. There's something called social penetration theory. And this is that the development of a relationship is associated with the kind of personal information people exchange. Uh, and so it's categorized in terms of breadth which is the variety of information that's shared, and depth, which is the personal significance of the information that's shared. So the cartoon, if you can't read it, it says the one person saying to the other person on a date, complete this sentence. I wish I had someone with whom I could share blank. Disclosure reciprocity says that when one person shares something personal, the other person immediately shares something equally personal. And this pattern's not as rigid later in a relationship. And so it's not seen as necessary, let's say, in a marital relationship. 
People who reveal private information too soon are viewed negatively. That's oversharing. And it seems like they would just tell this to anybody. So you're not special that they're telling it to you. And people avoid topics, um, certain topics, when there's a moderate level of intimacy. So people don't talk about things like their previous relationships. Oh, I was so in love with this other person. Or, you know, diseases they've had or, um, you know, problems that they've had. Um, kind of steer clear of that stuff. Researchers think of turning points that influence the level of commitment between people. And partners are uh, able to agree on what the major turning points in their relationships are. Often the turning point was a conversation where they talked openly about their intentions uh, with the relationship. So for example, uh, saying a mutual saying of I love you is a major turning point um, in a relationship. Uh, if you guys have ever seen the Star Wars movies, where Princess Leia tells Han Solo, I love you, and then he says, I know, and then she does the same to him in the next movie. Uh, it's a mutual I love you that we're talking about, not someone's dismissive, yeah, I know that you love me kind of approach. Let's finish this chapter by saying, though, that early attraction often fades, and the, the forces that initially draw people together really can't be the same ones that keep them together because relationships change and people change. And so uh, a lot of people think that this chapter is really all there is about romantic relationships. But this is really, like I said at the beginning, about initial romantic uh, attraction rather than uh, staying together for the long term. So that's chapter seven, and thanks for listening.